Um, hey everyone, welcome to tonight's At Home with Quendo. We have Dr. Matt Simpson um, and Christine Godson uh, from Evolve Women's Health here in Toowoomba to talk to us all about pelvic pain and physiotherapy and how they join, how they, all of the nuts and bolts about pelvic pain. So, um, I don't really have much else to say. Dr. Matt is an obstetrician gynecologist and uh, Christine is a, you're a bachelor, you're a physio, phys, physiotherapist um, with a bachelor, is that right? Yeah, so I've just done the basic undergraduate degree of physiotherapy and then um, I've gone on to do more coursework to work in the area of women's health. So. Oh, okay. um, some of us will go on and do further university study. They'll do a master's or a postgraduate degree um, and they will title themselves a, as a women's health physio. And some of us will just do more um, coursework. It's quite similar. It's just a pedantics of what you can say. So I'm a physiotherapist with a special interest in women's health. Oh, brilliant. Awesome. Yeah. So you're literally the best person to have this <laughs> pelvic um, chat, pelvic pain chat about. So I'll stop letting you look at my face and I'll stop my video and Dr. Matt, I'll let you take it away. Hi everyone, thanks for the introduction, Ash. Um, so as Ash said, um, my name's Matt. I'm an um, obstetrician gynecologist and I've got a, a special interest in pelvic pain endometriosis, which is why I've teamed up with Quendo and done a few talks for them now. And uh, I thought this was a really good topic when Ash suggested it, um, just to kind of talk a bit more about the other things that can be done for pelvic pain and for endo in particular, but also for other types of pelvic pain. I think pelvic pain is one of those things that hasn't been managed very well over the years, um, particularly if you go back, you know, 20, 30 years, unfortunately it was managed terribly and there was a lot of, it's just a women's problem, put up with it type attitude, which was totally inappropriate and not very helpful at all. And then happily we moved on from that to where people started to investigate things and we moved into doing surgery for endometriosis but again I think that was not providing holistic care uh, and so that was kind of the newer method of doing it but nowadays is probably still you know it's, it's not best practice anymore what we've come to recognize with time is that just doing the surgery and then leaving you on your own afterwards it's, it's not a great solution to the problem and it comes back to what the problem actually is. So when you think about pelvic pain, it's a pretty complicated area. Um, there's so many structures in that area that, that can be causing pain. When you think about it, you've got the bowels, you've got the bladder, you've got the uterus, the tubes, the ovaries, the muscles, the nerves, the skin, all interacting. And once one gets irritated, it starts to irritate the others. And then it goes around in a vicious circle and it can get to the point where you, you're not even sure what caused the problem in the first place. Um, so it's not as simple as just unpicking one thing, fixing that and saying, oh, well, problem's all solved. Because you might be leaving other areas still inflamed and irritated. Um, and then to top it on, uh, on top of all that, then you've got things, this new area that we're starting to look at now, which is central sensitization, where you get to the point where once you've had the pain for long enough, you'll start changing the whole pain pathways in your brain and down your spine, where they'll get stronger and stronger and stronger. And it can get to the point where you take away the reason for the pain and you still have the pain, unfortunately. And so modern practice for dealing with pelvic pain is now about attacking it as a team. We've come to recognise that, unfortunately, we're not brilliant at fixing it. We're getting better, but no one will promise you now, well, I would hope no one would promise you that you come in the room and you walk out pain free. It's just not a realistic goal for a lot of people. Now, some people get lucky. There's a fair percentage that get lucky, they have surgery, cut out the endometriosis if that's what the problem was and the pain is totally gone and for those people that's great and that's what we would love to happen to everybody but for a lot of people that's not the outcome that they get so then you have the question well okay we haven't completely fixed the problem what's the next step and the next step is holistic care you know looking after the whole person attacking it from multiple angles so that you have multiple people trying to help with different perspectives and different different modalities and trying to get you as good as we can. Now, sometimes that's 100% better, sometimes that's 70% better, but that's still hopefully enough that you can live your life and avoid having to come back for surgery every year or anything crazy like that. Now, I mean, obviously sometimes you do need repeat surgery, but we're trying with this team approach to put it off as long as we can, hopefully forever. 
so that's the modern way. We try and do that at Evolve Women's Health, and that's why we've got Chris working out of our rooms. She has a special interest in women's health, and she does the physio side of things. So I guess that's where I'm leading. But I thought before we quite got to that, and Chris will, and a lot of people wonder, well, what do the physios actually do to help me? And I'm sure Chris will explain all that. She's very, very good. Um, but I just thought I would just touch on the others as well, so you would understand why why we use the team approach and what that involves. So. When it comes to, I'll speak about it for endometriosis first, just briefly, and then we can sort of touch on if it's not endometriosis, what do we do? But as I'm sure a lot of you know, but just to go over it, endometriosis is when some of the lining of the womb is outside of the womb. Response to the hormones of your cycle, same as inside the womb. So the estrogen will tell it to grow in the first half of your cycle. The progesterone will tell it to stop growing in the second half. And when all the hormones are taken away at the end of your cycle, it'll try to shed. When it's in your womb, it sheds and comes out as your period. When it's in your tummy, it's got nowhere to go. So it causes pain, inflammation, causes things to stick together. Um, so that's what it is. In terms of treating it, so yes, surgery to cut it out, some kind of medication to suppress it from coming back. So that's going to be anything that's got the progesterone hormone in it because that'll be telling the lining of the womb to not grow, either in or out of the womb. And then beyond that, what do we do? We've cut it out. We're suppressing it coming back, but you've still got pain. And that may well be because other structures are inflamed. Irritable bowel is a very common association with endo. Um, now, dietitians have been shown to help with that. Uh, there are diets that um, have been tried that have been shown to help with endo symptoms and pelvic pain symptoms in general. So, because sometimes it's not endometriosis, sometimes it's irritable bowel that's the culprit that started it all off. So dietitians can be very helpful. Psychology is another really helpful area. And that's getting into that uh, central sensitization I was talking about before. So once you get those pain pathways that strong, sometimes it's very difficult to dampen them back down. Psychology can be really helpful with that. Uh, that's getting into, uh, there's things like neuro-linguistic programming that they can do where they try and train your brain to look away from the pain. Then the other thing that they can be very helpful with is, you know, it's a tough thing. You know, pelvic pain can be very hard to deal with and it can be quite hard to accept that maybe it's not gonna get completely better. And they can be very helpful with helping you frame that in your mind in a way that allows you to, to, to get on with your life and to you know, have a more joyful outlook on life, accepting that perhaps it's not going to be perfect. Um, so if you can get, um, we have a couple of psychologists that we try and work with that have a special interest in women's health. Because again, like everything, if you get somebody who works in the area all the time, they're going to be more knowledgeable. They're going to have be more understanding of the particular issues that you're dealing with and they'll have better tips for the outcome. So that's what we're trying to do, put together a team that each person has their area of interest and expertise that contributes to making you better. Um, and that's the modern way of dealing with pelvic pain. Now, it might not be endometriosis. As I said, it might be irritable bowel. It might be issues with your bladder that have caused other problems. It might be pelvic floor dysfunction. And this is where Chris comes in. People think, why, you know, what, what can physios do to help? But a lot of this pain in your abdomen can cause you to clench your pelvic floor. And that can cause pain in your pelvic floor. Um, and physios can be extremely helpful in that area. Uh, I, I recommend almost all my patients who come to me with pelvic pain, go see a physio. Um, because they can provide a lot of relief in that area. And sometimes even these flares with pain are actually pelvic floor muscle contractions rather than anything going on in your abdomen. So it's a very helpful area. Now, having said that, nobody needs, you know, might not necessarily need all aspects of the team. Obviously that can get expensive, sometimes time consuming. It might not necessarily be useful, but you sort of pick and choose what am I, how are my symptoms presenting? Who do I think is going to help? And the idea behind that is, you know, sometimes surgery helps plus physio and sometimes surgery doesn't help. Sometimes I go in there and we can't find the reason for the pain. Now, that's not to say that the pain is not there. That's to say that, unfortunately, modern medicine is not good enough to work out what it is. But we still have to help you. And so if we can't help you with surgery, then we have to help you in other ways. And that's where allied health come into their own as well, you know, they can still work with these um, other areas that can be causing pain and try and make things a bit better. Um, so I think that's kind of the main points that I wanted to get across. Uh, I think as Chris talks, I'll probably think of more things I should have said and we can always go backwards and forwards a little bit, but um, I might hand you over to Chris now to just sort of explain, okay, you've come to see me um, and I've suggested that pelvic floor physio would be helpful. Um, 
what would you do? Where do you go? What do you do? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, hi, I'm Chris. I'm a physiotherapist here at Evolve Women's Health. Um, so I do work with a lot of women who have um, experienced pelvic pain for a short time, quite acutely, or probably more often it's been a really long history. Um, in reality, often by the time someone's seeking help, I usually find there's quite a number of years, um, sometimes even a decade or more of history of having had some sort of pain element and then it's gotten to the point they're finally doing something about it mm -hmm. or someone's asked them to, to or suggested they they try something something different. So my role within the pelvic pain area is to sort of try and help different, differentiate some of the symptoms that can sort of coincide and get all tangled up together. So sometimes it's an abdominal pain the woman's experiencing, sometimes it's a vaginal pain that she's experiencing, sometimes it's pain in the bottom itself, sometimes it's pain radiating, radiating down her thigh, down her, her leg, Sometimes it's pain um, uh, more with what other ones floating, like mm. different. It, it's so, it presents in so many different ways. It can be bladder pain. Um, it might be when her bladder's really full that that's when she's experiencing the pain or when she's doing wheeze. There's so many different ways that pelvic pain is experienced. Um, my job is to look at the muscular elements and the soft tissue elements. So I look at muscles, um, I look at the nerve pathways um, and their potential influences, and I look at a lot of the connective tissues and the fascias um, that sort of run through there as well. And then I'm just looking sort of at the interplay of things to see if I can notice anything that might not be functioning um, as we think it should or as good as it could be. And so a lot of my role is about just optimising. So. I might not be curing, but I'm just trying to optimize the system as best that we can. Um, so I often think it's helpful if we kind of have a bit of a, a look at the, the pelvic floor muscles, because that can, I think, give us a little bit more of an understanding of what goes on. So um, this is the pelvis, and I'm sorry, I know I'm not the best at giving visuals, but um, this is the pelvis as if I was standing straight in front of you um, and you were looking from in front, okay? so. This is now the pelvis looking up from below. And this is where we start to get our first glance or glimpse of the pelvic floor muscles. And so we're gonna have a look at the more superficial muscles, the muscles that are closest to the skin. Um, so lying on my back, um, this is the pubic bone at the top here, and we've got the very little tailbone at the base. So we've got the three openings as the woman, got the little urethra up the top, vagina in the middle, anal sphincter at the base there. So. What I always sort of like you to sort of notice about this first layer of your pelvic floor muscles is the way it really wraps around the openings. Okay, so we can see how these muscle fibers really have a, a closing type action um, to the openings of the woman. And so a lot of women, if these muscles are very uh, tense, if they're very tender to touch, if they're very over responsive and tend to just tighten and grip a lot or can actually go into spasm, um, a woman might find it really difficult to wear a tampon. It's really difficult to pass the tampon because it's, it's stimulating that muscle tissue too much, causing her a lot of discomfort. Um, she might often find uh, penetrative intercourse really uncomfortable. She might not even be able to let the, the penis to pass in um, very deeply at all or at all because of that discomfort. And that can be that muscle causing a lot of that sort of um, concern there. And then if I turn the pelvis around, and this is where it gets a bit tricky to get the right angle, sorry, girls. Um, again, pubic bones are at the top. So this is as if I'm lying on my back and you're looking down um, from my head. So we've got, the, we've got the vagina just here and we've got the anal sphincter just at the base there. But now we've got these longer muscle fibers, these arms of um, muscle fibers running deep within the pelvis. And so these muscle fibers um, can also get a lot of pressure during intercourse or if they were really quite tight, um, quite narrowed in the arms there, in the space, again, you might place a tampon in and you might not feel comfortable with it. Um, for most women, if they put a tampon inside the vagina, we should feel it pass at the entrance because we've got a lot of sensation in that first sort of two centimetres of the vagina, but not so much deeper within. Um, so we should be able to pass it and then not really notice that it's there. So if you pop that inside and you've got a lot of pressure, it's uncomfortable, we'd be a little bit suspicious that maybe there's something going on. And I'd be sort of targeting those muscles um, to see what that was. So in the other parts of the body, if you were to come to a physio and tell, you know, tell me I've got a sore arm, I would want to look at that, that muscle. I would want to touch that muscle to feel what it's like, see if there's any tender spots that I can locate. I'd want to check what the muscles like to contract. How does it work functionally? Um, things like that. 
And that's exactly how my brain's kind of looking at the pelvic floor. It's just that the pelvic floor is in that awkward spot. It's really, it's internal. We can't see it from the externals. So a lot of the information I gather um, is through a vaginal exam. Um, and so when you come in to see a, a physiotherapist, if we've gone through um, all the symptoms and, and questioning, and we've decided that it's worth pursuing a bit more of a physical exam, we might suggest that we actually do a, a pelvic exam, okay? And the first part of that pelvic exam is to have a look more at the entrance, more at the, the superficial muscles and the skin and the, and the tissues there. And there's a few clues that we can get straight away as to whether the muscles might be a bit tense or a bit tight. Um, so one of the things we look at is we actually sort of look at the distance um, of sort of the urethra down to this anal sphincter here. And it gives us an idea um, if it's quite a narrow distance, we're anticipating that the muscle fibres inside are probably shortening a bit to actually narrow that distance. Um, we also sort of check, we get a bit of an idea of the perineum, which is where the skin sort of covers this space between the base of the vagina and the anal sphincter. We get a bit of an idea of whether that sits level with the, the little bones in the, uh, the middle of the bottom, the ischial tuberosities. Um, if the pelvic floor is just resting, relaxed, not contracting, we would anticipate it would be fairly level. And sometimes we, we notice that that's actually drawn in quite a bit. So before we even do an assessment, we go with an anticipation of, okay, that pelvic floor might be on the tensor side. And then we have to start trying to work out, well, if the pelvic floor is looking a bit tensor or shortened, is it that the brain is sending lots of signals to this muscle to contract repetitively um, and often, or is it that it's actually been kept short for a long time and now the muscle fibers have tightened a bit? And they can be two different things that we sort of have to work on. You know, one's more a coordination training, neural pathways, and the other one's more about stretching and, and um, getting more length into connective tissues and, and muscle fibers again. So once we've done a bit of a visual exam, um, we will then just externally sort of palpate the tissues. There are some women who are really, really tender and sensitive, even surrounding the vulva. So not even thinking about going to the entrance of the vagina or within, they might have a lot of tenderness and sensitivity around here. And a lot of that will sort of come about, sometimes if you've had an episode of, it can be really innocuous things. You might've just had an episode of thrush once, or you might've had a really bad UTI or just something. And the nerve endings just at that skin and, and right at those entrance there, They've gotten a little bit, for want of a better word, a bit dramatic from that, that bad experience, from that, that acute pain episode. And so instead of when the issue resolved, the initial instigating issue when it resolved, instead of those nerve endings just going back to, okay, fine, I'll just report up to the brain the really important stuff when there's pain and something I think is going to cause harm, I'll tell the brain. It's like it drops its threshold. And so these nerve endings just start to report nearly everything. And so I'll lightly touch somewhere and a woman might go, oh my gosh, that's really, that's burning. That's, that's a eight out of 10 pain. Even though we know that's light touch, you know, that, you know, logically like that can't hurt me. It can't harm me. You know, pain is meant to be a message to our, our brain to warn us that, hey, there's, there's something that could be threatening here. Just pay attention just in case something harmful is going to happen. So it is, it's an important thing that we do notice pain. It's just, we've got to make sure it's still in check that the nerves are giving us the information that's important and that's relevant, that they're not just scouting around all the time and trying to send, a, send up and signal everything, every sort of stimulus that they come across. So there is often um, a lot of time that we might spend time, even before we think about doing much of an internal exam, we might start to spend some time trying to desensitize or habituate that part of the body. Um, so those tissues that are acting quite sensitive to touch or to what should be normal stimulus, we might, and so that might look something like um, you might go home with a home practice where you just learn to place pressures um, at different points around the vulva or around the vagina, wherever it is that you're getting that tenderness or those symptoms. And what will normally happen, and we check this in clinic to make sure you're going to respond before I give it to you in, as homework, but what will normally happen is I'll, I'll place that pressure there and initially, um, the woman might go, okay, that's a six out of 10 pain. I go, okay, all right, I'm not going to move. I'm just going to keep the pressure there. And now your job is to keep telling your brain that you're safe and that this is okay. All right, so 
I'll coach you in sort of breathing, trying to do a nice diaphragmatic breath so that we're keeping the breath rate slow, keeping the heart rate slow. And then I'll often get you to sort of, or get the woman to try and come up with a, a phrase that helps her identify actually what she's feeling. Um, so it might be, okay, this is actually, this is, it's a little bit of stretch. Okay, it's quite intense. It's a little bit of stretch, but this is safe. It can't harm my tissues. And so what will often happen, sometimes very quickly, sometimes it's like less than five seconds. Sometimes it's more around the 30 second mark, but they'll usually come a time where she'll suddenly go, I don't feel that anymore. And it might be completely resolved or it'll be more than halved, that initial sort of intensity. And so what sort of happens um, with the habituation or with the desensitization is that because we've kept the body and the nervous system really calm, it's basically told the brain, um, there's no threat here. It's okay. You don't have to keep paying attention to this. I'm perfectly safe. And so then the brain kind of get, gets bored after a while and goes, all right, I'll think about something else. I'll go attend to something more important. And so if we keep doing that, and again, it's, it's one of those, how, how soon will I get better from this? It's a hard question to ask because some women, they do this and then the next time they come back, they've done it a couple of times and they're like, they're fine. They're like, this is great. You know, I, I feel fully comfortable here. I'm really confident. And other women, it might take a few months of fairly repetitious work and, and it's a bit of a grind to get to that point where they're really comfortable um, with touch and with movements and things. And once we get used to touch, there's other nerve receptors that um, give us our mechano sensors that pick up the movement. So we've got to also sometimes work on them. And sometimes it's the stretch ones that might be a bit more feisty. So we kind of just go through and, and work out what we think would help us the most, depending on um, what we find. And then when we decide we want to do that internal exam, we're actually exploring the muscle tissue even further. So usually I'll just start with a single digit um, and I'll just insert that finger just very shallowly um, initially, just at the entrance. And that's where I'm sort of exploring um, tone and tenderness and tension within that muscle that surrounds the vagina. And so we'll just place that bit of pressure, maybe a bit of stretch at those different um, sort of points around there. And then internally, um, it's not so easy to see, but by going through the, the vaginal walls, we actually get to feel directly onto all that muscular tissue in through there. And so we can go searching. If it's more that, total, like if you were getting pain during intercourse, um, but you're like, oh, I'm totally fine at the entrance. I can, you know, we can initiate penetration, that's fine, but just deeper within, there's always something deeper within, or I'm, I'm really aching inside after intercourse then we'll really be exploring through this sort of muscle tissue and we'll be just like any other muscle. Are we going, does that hurt? Does that hurt? Does that hurt? And so we often will find that there's some points of tenderness in there. And I always warn my girls before I do this, that, okay, okay if I find something and you tell me it hurts, there'll be a look of glee in my eyes. And I don't mean that in a really nasty way. It's more just when we find that there's a muscular cause to pain, it's great because we can work on that. We can change that. Um, that's something that we can really influence. Um, so I don't mean to come across as a nasty, mean person, but that's where it comes from. It comes from a place of goodness. Um, so we will often end up doing, um, if you've ever had like uh, muscle work on other parts of your body, often we'll do, we call them sort of trigger points or, or pressure points um, within the muscle. So we'll find that really tender spot and we'll just leave a pressure there, kind of like we did at the entrance, but a bit deeper into the flesh of the muscle this time. And we'll just wait till the muscle fibers kind of go, <sighs> and they give a little, and we'll move on and we'll find all those pressure points. And then once we can sort of tolerate pressure points really well, then we'll often go into sort of these bowing techniques where we'll sort of go along the line of the fibers and we'll just sort of move them side to side. And we're just trying to get those fibers just sort of elongating a little bit, um, but hopefully in a safe way and in a way that they will go with it and eventually just soften, okay? And then there are times where we do really wanna try and lengthen the muscle tissue, give it a really good blood supply and lengthen it a bit as well. And that's when we'll sort of follow the line of the muscle and quite deeply pressing into it, we'll really sort of um, release in through it there. And we'll often teach you how to do that yourself if that's something that we think needs to be done um, a few times, like on a, on a semi-regular basis. Um, we can teach you to do it yourself or we have some, some tools, some little therapeutic tools that can make it a little bit easier. Um, so that's kind of, I guess, the crux of a lot of the, the muscle work that we do within physiotherapy. Um, and that's kind of often a starting point.
point, um, but that's very honed in. That's very sort of isolated right in at the pelvis itself. And the reality is, is that the pelvic floor and the pelvis is part of the body and the bigger, broader system. And if I was to only look there, I guess it's like you mm -hmm. saying with the modern medicine versus the old ways. Um, the old ways in physios was that we did, we got really obsessive as women's health physios mm -hmm. and we got very stuck in the pelvic floor and kind of forgot to step back and look more broadly. Um, and the pelvic floor, it's really interesting. We're finding more and more that within the pelvic floor, there's a lot of reflexive work that needs to be going on and underlying and underpinning the pelvic floor function. And so your pelvic floor works quite reflexively with your, with your breathing, with the diaphragm muscle um, that sort of sits above in the lower part of the ribs. And so they kind of do a dance together in the body that as I breathe in and the diaphragm descends and flatten, my pelvic floor lengthens a little bit. As I breathe out, my pelvic floor shortens and my diaphragm peaks up. And so they do this beautiful little, almost like a tango together, or maybe it's more of a gentle dance. I'm not a dancer, I won't get the right one. Um, but they do, they, they have this synergy together in the body. And so we often notice if we look at someone and how they're breathing, someone who's carrying a lot of tension in their pelvic floor, they're often that person that is kind of quite tense in the other parts, up in the neck, up in the shoulders. They're breathing quite shallow up in the chest and they're really not getting any great movement or excursion in the, in the diaphragm. And so a lot of my work often is spent around um, some of that breath awareness and going, okay, let's, let's get that more automatics happening. Because I know as soon as I can get you breathing with your diaphragm, I've got a better chance of you starting to get a little bit of automatic movement and mobility in your pelvic floor. And then from there, we can start to work a bit more on purposeful relaxation. And then from there, we can work a bit more on actually stretching or lengthening that part of the body if that's what we need to do. Very, very rarely, I shouldn't say very rarely, sometimes we do have to bring in a strengthening element to your pelvic floor as well. Um, and that's more because this is where it gets a bit murky because a lot of women who have pelvic pain often also have other symptoms like they might have a bit of bladder leakage um, and it could be the cough, sneeze catches them out. And when you start telling a woman that she's got a tense pelvic floor or an overactive pelvic floor, but she leaks when she coughs, she just looks at you as if you're, no, that doesn't seem right. You're telling me I've got a really tight pelvic floor. Shouldn't everything stay in? Shouldn't it just, nothing should leak, like surely if that's the case. And that's where it, it does start to get a bit confusing, but the pelvic floor, it's, it's gotta be a really dynamic structure. It's gotta be a really dynamic muscle group. It's a bit like trying to catch a ball is the best way I think I can describe it. So if I want to catch a ball successfully, if I hold my hands really tense and really rigid, I'm not going to catch that ball. I'm probably, I might get in the right spot, but I'm probably going to fumble it. So if I want to catch that ball, I've got to have the, be active, be ready, but I've got to have the dynamic response, the right amount, the coordination um, to actually catch that ball. And so if I'm a bit tense in that pelvic floor, there's two things that can come into play. One, I just don't have any more, more space to go. I've already shortened that muscle group, so it hasn't got the dynamic reaction that it needs quickly and briskly in certain circumstances. And the other thing that can come into play is often later in the day or as the day progresses, the muscles get tired, they fatigue. They are doing double time all of the day and they'll get quite fatigued. And I guess there's often that question of why, why would you choose to have your muscles working like that? And Matt kind of brought that up before and that this is often a really protective response that we find in women. They've had these monthly episodes um, lasting for indefinite periods of time where there's been really intense pain in that abdominal space or down in the pelvic cavity. And just like any other part of your body, if you've had a bad episode of back pain, first thing you notice is how the muscles just lock around it to try and protect you. They stiffen that part of your body to try not to let you move it until you can work out what's going on, until you can work out and reassure your brain that, no, nope, none of my bones are broken. No, nope, none of my muscles are torn. Okay, it's safe to keep moving. So it's a protective response, um, but we just have to make sure that it doesn't take over. And so unfortunately, yeah, in the setting of really painful periods, we often find women have got these very tense pelvic floors and sometimes quite painful pelvic floors um, as a consequence mm. of that. Mm. Um, I'm just trying to think what else I should tell you guys about your initial appointment. Um, I should warn you, if you do ever go to see a, a women's health physio, we, we love to talk. Um, 
as you might notice. And so our first session, usually on average, um, you'd expect about an hour um, for that first initial appointment. And that's just to give us time to go through all the different aspects of your pelvic floor function. So we'll be talking about the pain, if that's the main reason that you're coming in. But we'll also do a quick screen. What's your bladder function like? What's your bowel function like? Um, what's your sexual function like? Are there any supporting sort of um, concerns within the pelvis? Is there a little bit of prolapse or lax laxity that could be driving some of the discomfort or um, muscular responses that we come across as well? That talking is really good too, and I think that's another aspect of it. Having somebody else to talk to apart from just the doctor who has a different perspective and who, who knows you might get a better connection with can be really important. And they may explain it in a different way that you understand better and you feel like you can open up more with. Um, and that can be really, really helpful. So that, that is another aspect of it that's really important when you talk about doing things in a team. Yeah, yeah. and I think, yeah. I think that is something that as a physio I feel really lucky is that generally we do have a bit more of the gift of time with yeah. people. Um, yeah. So that, and, and that's really important that we do give you space that you need to tell your story um, mm. as best you can in the words um, that you can. Um, and then we sort of, like I said, we go through, we screen those other spaces. We may or may not do a physical exam that first um, visit. There are some women who they're just like, I just need to know, I just need to know what's going on. And so definitely we'd go ahead and get that done. And there's some women who come in and just, it can be really emotional just having to tell your story again um, to another person or as we've gone through and we've sort of looked at the other symptoms there's been a lot of us other stuff going on so we decide you know what we're, we're going to take our time we'll do the bladder diary um, we'll do a few other things um, try try a few other things and then we'll go from there um, again talking a bit more holistically we sort of went okay let's zoom out of the pelvis let's look a bit more and we started talking about breathing and we started talking about how we might notice sort of tension in other parts of the body um, and we definitely know there does seem to be an association um, if we're looking at pain levels or um, if we're looking at chronic pain in particular, stress levels um, mm. definitely have an interplay with how your brain is going to perceive um, pain signals um, or signals from other similar signals from your body. So it's, it's part of my role as well to kind of explore, are there some stresses in your life that could be playing into this? And am I someone that can kind of help you navigate that a bit or often my conversation will be around you know what I think this would be a really um, great opportunity to link in with a counsellor or a psychologist and, mm -hmm. and have someone else, like a more expert um, sort of um, guidance in sort of navigating through this and it, it's, it is an emotional thing when you've been living with pain for a long time um, it affects you in so many different ways um, it really impacts quality of life it can impact your self-esteem um, it can impact your body image. Um, it's not uncommon for me to have a, a, a girl in here who might, or a woman in here who will talk quite negatively about that part of her body. I've had women tell me that um, because sex was so painful, they just decided it wasn't for them. They decided that they thought that they were just born that way and that they weren't meant to have that part of their, mm -hmm. their life to explore. Um, and, and there is, there's like, there's a lot of... Um, sometimes a lot of disconnect from that part of your body because it feels like it's really let you down. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, you know, I, yes, I can listen and I can offer a mm -hmm. few little helpful things here or there, but on the whole, they're the conversations that are really useful to have with that person who can help you start exploring deeper, reframing, um, helping you through that, that mm -hmm. part. Um, it's a really important part of it. The other um, thing that's really good to look at is just general exercise and activity. Um, so we know within um, pelvic pain and pain episodes, we know that um, sleep makes a difference. So those that are getting good sleep hygiene, you know, a good amount of sleep to feel really rested and restored, that they're not um, living, you know, chronically in a sleep deficit, flicking off lots of those, um, you know, adrenalines and cortisols and stress hormones to try and sort of just stay awake and stay up and active. Mm -hmm. Um, nutrition definitely plays a point, um, as Matt talked about before, and that's where the dietitian um, and just reading up a bit on the nutritional side of things can be really useful. Um, exercise, I'm a physio, I have to talk <laughs> about exercise. Um, I went to a research update last year, no, I can't say last year, it was the year before around this, um, and we got presented with quite a number of the, the, um, the studies that have been done in the, in the last sort of five years around exercise and endometriosis or exercise and, and pelvic pain and basically all of them are favorable 
if you exercise, you're probably going to have less pain and your symptoms are probably going to be better than those that don't engage in regular exercise or activity. So there didn't really seem to be a great standout leader of which type of exercise to do. Um, there was one surprise and it hasn't been explored further, but just in one of the studies, um, one of the types of exercises they looked at was doing pelvic floor exercises. So just typical, contract, hold, release, and doing that a few times. And it actually turned out the girls that were practicing the pelvic floor exercises had significantly less pain. Um, and particularly it was during their period if they practiced the pelvic floor exercises during the time of their period. So that hasn't been explored further. And that might just be one of those things that it just randomly came up and it's not going to be proven again in another no, study. Sometimes. Yeah, it might be a, a red herring. But I think in my mind, when I heard about that, it really had me wondering, okay, it kind of went with, well, probably what's happening in the period is we're getting a lot of our cramping, our pain. Our muscles are probably going into a spasm, which if you've ever had like a spasm in another part of your body, like your calf muscle, you know, you wake up at night and it's stuck, you know, to relieve it, you've got to get that mobility and that blood flow back into it. And so I wonder if that's what the contract relax was doing was mm -hmm. just that focal, getting a little bit of that blood supply there, getting a little bit of that mobility into the tissues and helping them not get super mm -hmm. contracted or going, maybe tipping over into a spasm response. So um, you could give that a go gently, nothing aggressive or too mm -hmm. exciting with the pelvic floor, but just gently doing a little bit of contract relax next time you have a period mm -hmm. and see if that makes a difference. Um, but definitely like the yogas, the walking, um, all the lower um, impact type exercises were very favorable. Um, we've got to watch high intensity exercise. So it's a bit of a balance point. So high intensity exercise can be really useful for a lot of women uh, with mental health and just getting this real um, energy um, endorphin rush um, from it. But sometimes it's tipping your body because you're working more into your anaerobic state rather than staying in your aerobic capacity, which is our happy place when we exercise, um, the brain and the body kind of starts tipping over into those more stress hormone release, okay? Because you're really, you're pushing your body beyond what it feels quite capable of. And so that's where we sort of can start to see a little bit of a tip sometimes. So high intensity, we're, we've just sort of got to balance it out a little bit and just see how you respond um, symptomatically to it. But basically any others, um, any movement, I'm going to encourage you to invite and keep seeking more and more of. Um, mm -hmm. If it feels good, um, go for it pretty much is my tip. Well, it's been really good to hear you explain all the different things that are involved in being seen by a physio. I've learned some things, but oh, this is good. <laughs> I always learn things, try to. Um, but also so many um, people, when I say to them, have you considered physio? And the first thing they say, oh, I've done pelvic floor exercises. You know, I do that all the time, that doesn't help. And they think that that's what the physio will do. They'll go to you and you'll tell them how to do the pelvic floor exercises they've heard about off, on the, off the radio or off, off some TV show. And that's all you'll do and you'll just tell them how to do that. And to explain that there's so much more involved and it's about trigger points and working out which muscles are causing the problem. It's, there's so much more to it than pelvic floor exercises. That might not even be part of it at all. Um, and I think it's good for people to learn that. And the other last point I was going to make is that just when we talk about pelvic pain, it's not normal. And I think for so many years, people thought it was normal. Obviously, there's a little bit of period pain that everybody will get, and that's normal. But if it's impacting on your life, it is not normal. And there might be something we can do about it. Now, we might not be able to fix it completely, but we can certainly try and make it a lot better. And you don't have to suffer with it. And there's more than one option. And I think that's the other thing we're trying to show. It doesn't necessarily mean come to the doctor and you have to have surgery. There's so many other things we can do. Um, and that's sort of the message that I hope you take away from this. And that, that pain management side of things, mm. um, as a physio, sometimes we're off, if we're not making the progress that we want or we know it's going to take some time and, and that woman needs a more immediate solution to be able to get to work, to be able to just turn up, do the things that she needs to do. Um, we'll often play around with like a TENS machine. Um, so that electrical current, popping that on the nerve roots that supply um, where you're getting the pain to seeing if we can interfere with the, the pain nerve channels so that you're sensing and feeling that very bizarre, weird electrical current rather than picking up on so much of the, the, the pain. Mm. Um, and that, that can be really useful to a lot of women too. That is like... Matt, you have literally just summed up 
absolutely everything. So you're like saving me a job. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do have a few questions like most of them Chris you sort of answered during the way through but I think if we sort of just touch base on the direct like direct moment of like the same of like how many sessions could it take yeah you to be better yeah um I think probably more typically the sooner we get to see you um from onset of symptoms we've got a better chance of it being a shorter trajectory and being able to hopefully resolve it quite quickly. Um, I do occasionally, do, I am not promising this, I do occasionally um, have a woman, she'll come in, we do that thorough first assessment and then she cancels the next one because she goes, you know what, I'm actually feeling really good and she feels confident that she knows she can keep working on it. Might not be perfect yet, but she feels like she's got the tools at least to keep going. Because my job isn't to be the hand that fixes things. My job is to hopefully educate um, you about your body, help you understand how your body's responding to different things, and then get you to trust your own instincts in yourself that, yes, you can get through this and you can um, hopefully get to that point that you want to be. Um, giving us the tools we need to succeed, I guess. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The other thing I was going to say on that point, because I guess something that might be behind that question is cost. Um, yeah. because that can often be a big issue. And unfortunately, the public system, although they're trying, um, oftentimes the physio departments are overwhelmed and good luck seeing a women's health physio in any kind of timely manner, sadly. Some hospitals, some public hospitals are better than others. Um, but when you're going privately, yes, you will get some money back from your extras if you've got private health and you're using your extras. But there is another pathway, whereas if you've got a chronic condition, which pelvic pain is, if you get a specialist and a GP to agree it's a chronic condition, you can go on a care plan and then you'll get some money back from Medicare on your physio visits. So it does mean you have to go through, see the specialist first, unfortunately, for them to agree. But, you, you know, you don't necessarily need to have private health and need to have expensive surgery. There is ways to access support without it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that all that. Sorry. Sorry, Chris, you go. I was just going to say, in, in Toowoomba, I, I haven't done too much of a price check lately but I think you'll find the range of going to see a private uh, physio in, in women's health sits between about $150 to um, a bit over $200 they're sometimes gonna be a little bit more expensive than that and that will usually cover the hour um, and the other incidentals that go into that appointment so it is an investment um, we, we acknowledge that and, but it, I guess it's different like um, if you see a musculoskeletal physio because you've sprained your ankle you know, you might see them quite a number of times in a short space of period um, just to get going again. Generally, most women we're working with, this is a chronic condition. So this is going to take a bit of time. And a lot of it, like I said, is, is giving you the tools for you to start working on this. And so more often than not, we'll do that initial and then we'll catch up in a few weeks. And then we'll catch up in a few weeks. And it sort of usually gradually gets a bit longer and longer. So sometimes I might sort of be working with the woman for about three months and we might have seen each other about three times over that span. And sometimes it might be that we sneak in a few extra during the rest of that year or that. Um, so yeah. there are some situations where um, as a woman, you might want a bit more contact. Um, you might just want a bit more support, a little bit more encouragement, um, reassurance, and, and that's fine. We can do that. If you want some weekly visits just to get the ball rolling, We'll do that, but more often than not, I find that we can do enough in that first session that you can take that away and, yeah, we don't need to catch up for a little bit to so feel ready for that next bit. That's, that's very good. That's good advice right there. I've just logged into the Quindo Instagram and someone sent through a good one. Sort of relation to, but going back to the painful sex, mm -hmm. vaginismus. Mm -hmm. what would you recommend dilators to help with um so if the muscle is uh, has a contracture so if the muscle is actually shortened because it's been kind of tense for a really long time so imagine if you walked around with your arm bent for weeks and weeks and weeks on end there would come a point where we wouldn't be able to get it fully straight 
okay? All those tissues would actually shorten and we'd have some restricted range, right? So you would need to do some fairly extensive long stretching, yep. Yeah. And that's where dilators really come into play. So if we've got some contracture, some actual tightening, shortening of the muscle fibres, we go to stretch. And so the dilators are like a staged um, stretching routine that, regime that you can go through. So it starts with a really narrow, slim one, um, you know, usually about essentially like a, a digit um, or a little bit slend more slender than that. Once you can tolerate that well and feel comfortable with the full passing of it, you go up to the next thickness and you go up to the next. Um, and typically if we're doing that, if you actually have a, a partner that you're sexually active with at the time, we're just aiming to get you to the dilator that's a little bit bigger than his girth when he's fully erect, um, just so that you have got a bit of uh, wiggle room for one of a better description. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> that was actually a really good question. I, that's, yeah, that's very. So, so sometimes the vaginismus is, it's actually contracted and, and it's tight and we have to stretch. Um, Sometimes the vaginismus is that the muscles are reacting. Mm. So the muscles still have normal length and compliance, but they just, as soon as they feel or sense anything, they close down, they're too responsive. And so the dilators aren't going to be so effective there. That's where we're going to do a lot more desensitization, a lot more connection with you of how to feel your muscles, how to contact your muscles, but how to relax your muscles, how to lengthen your muscles purposely, those sorts. Thing. And that's another a good example of the fact that not all pelvic pain is endometriosis. There are a lot of other conditions out there that we can help with as well. Yeah. I know a lot of endo um, girls do have a lot of like pain with sex and a lot mm. of it is referred back to, you know, the whole point of there's so much pain there mm. that they just think it's all linked to endo. Um but. And, and, and it, it, to be honest, I have to say of all the red flags that I ask about for when I'm thinking, do you have endometriosis? I tend to find that's the one that has the highest strike rate. If people tell me they have painful intercourse deep inside, more often than not, when I go look inside, like look inside your tummy, I do find endometriosis, I have to say, but it's not a guarantee, but it definitely is a common cause of painful intercourse and cutting it out in that area will definitely help. But it's the same thing if you've already established those pathways and you associate sex with pain, me just cutting that out is not going to magically make it better. And that's where Chris can really help because she can do those desensitization things that over time, combined with removing the endometriosis, put things back to normal. Yeah. And so there are times um, when a woman might choose to invite her partner um, into her physio sessions as well so that he understands exactly what's going on ah uh, yeah. yes and also yep. because he may end up being part of our therapy um so yep. because it's it's one thing for you to apply that desensitization pro um, program and for you to to learn to be comfortable because you you trust yourself like you are you have that instant feedback it's another thing to trust someone else yeah and so often it's then about coaching that partner of how they're going to become involved and and go from there. It's always up to the woman. It's what she what she feels will work best for her. Yeah. But just with talking about painful sex, I wanted to just bring up this product if um, anyone isn't aware. Like, obviously, I want you to try and um, see someone and, and treat things as best you can. But if you guys haven't come across the owner before, um, this is a device that was made by a woman, by a patient, by a woman who was experiencing um, deeper pain during intercourse. It won't be so helpful if it's the superficial pain, okay, or the vaginismus. It can help vaginismus a little bit because we can, um, basically we've got these stackable O-nuts and so we can just use one and slide it over the shaft of the penis. And so that means that less of the penis can come inside. So if it's just that right high up on this particular angle, I get this pain, um, then this would just mean that the penis can't go in quite so deep. Now, he still feels like he's got full penetration. He still feels like he gets a pleasurable experience, but it makes means that you can relax. You know that it's not going to hit that bad spot. You can stack these up and create as shallow a, a penetration as you feel you need to be comfortable. And they're just they're these nice little silicon squishy um, little rings. Okay. So th there's something that, and, and I guess that's kind of my job as well is to sort of just wrap raise awareness so hey did you know that this was available um it might be something you want to consider or look into or 
yeah, if we think there's therapies or tools that might be useful. I have learned so much tonight. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, I don't know whether anyone who's on tonight has any questions. Um, if you want to pop them in the chat, um, to do, I don't, I think you pretty much answered all of the ones that have come through on social media <laughs> to us. Um, one and the other one, oh, sorry, would be um, sort of exercises. Like, is there, you know, you could normally do um, like Kegels and things like that just while you're sitting at your desk. Like, is there anything you want to, like, you could take, you could let, oh my goodness, leave the girls yeah. here with tonight. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's tricky because it's, it's like a lot of things. Um, one size doesn't fit all generally. And so what I will always encourage, and so what I'll get everyone to do now, this is always sort of like a starting point um, that I would look at doing, is um, just try and sit up um, in your chair, on the edge of the bed, wh wherever you are right now. Um, when you're trying to connect with the feeling of your pelvic floor, it's easier to feel and get your pelvic floor to respond if it's in its mid-range of length and that's when you're in a neutral pelvis. So that's when um, I'll just try and sort of stand up here. You guys stay sitting. But if your pelvis is really tipped forward, okay, your, your pelvic floor muscles are going to shorten a little bit. If you're really tipped back through your pelvis, so you're, you're resting on your tailbone, you're actually going to be lengthening your, your pelvic floor a little bit. And so it's just it's easier to access the muscle when we're more in that mid range of the muscle fibers. So what I'll get you to do first is just sort of roll forward on your chair, tip forward too far, so your bottom's nearly leaving the chair, roll back so the tailbone's touching and then come into the middle. And when you come into the middle, you should really find that you find those sits bones right in the middle of your bottom that you're going, yep, there's some pressure through those sits bones. Now you can do this too if you like. You've got pelvic floor muscle. <laughs> <laughs> it is different to ours. Okay. Um, so from there, uh, probably the easiest space to feel it is if we think about the muscle that surrounds the anal sphincter, we'd have some beautiful nerve endings there, right at the entrance that give us a lot of sensations. So I want you to imagine that you've got wind, okay, and you've chosen to hold the wind in rather than let it out. So tighten around the anal sphincter, draw inward a little bit as if you're holding in the wind, okay. Now, as we do that, and you should still be holding, we're not changing our breath. We should feel really comfortable breathing, okay, and we shouldn't have lifted up from our chair. We shouldn't have clenched our bottom cheeks. Now, release and let it go. And whenever we're doing a muscle activation, we want to make sure that, yeah, we've got a good contraction, but we also want to make sure that we have a good let go, a good full relaxation. So if you're contracting your pelvic floor, you should feel a similar let go phase. So if you sort of go, oh, I feel like I've got something. I don't feel the let go. Just don't feel the let go. Okay. And that's often the story I get is I just don't feel it. it's just gone. I go to let it go and it's, it's gone. So they can be some clues that maybe, well, maybe we've just got a really pel weak pelvic floor and it, it holds a flicker and it's gone. More likely it's probably a pelvic floor that just holds tension and doesn't want to let it go. That's its happy space. It's what it's used. Well, it's not its happy space. Unfortunately, it causes pain sometimes, but that's what it's really good at and used to doing. And so we actually have to get better at letting go to get more function out of that muscle and get more normality out of it. The next cue I would look at doing and trying, so stay in that nice neutral pelvic position. Um, and anyone who's, anyway, I'll give the cue and then anyone who laughs, just laugh if you need to. Um, just imagine there's a marble resting at the entrance of the vagina right now. So it's probably on the chair, um, just there. You're gonna gently sort of tighten around the marble just at the entrance. And then you're gonna try and pick up the marble and take it inside. Okay, see if you can lift it up inside. But again, you haven't changed your breathing. This is all happening internally. Okay, you're not clenching, you know, you're not tensing your thigh muscles, you're not tense anywhere else in the body, it's just internal. And then you're going to ease the marble all the way back down to the very, very entrance. And just make sure you've let go of any of that tension remaining. And so again, you're trying to feel like, yep. Yeah, there's a bit of a tightening at the entrance and then there's something a little bit deeper within that I can connect with and I can definitely feel it let go. And if you're having trouble sort of feeling both aspects of the muscle, 
I would caution you against trying to just go ahead with Kegels um, because you might just be getting even better at this part of the muscle and you're forgetting all about that other really important range, that really important aspect to it. Exercise is all about the contraction and not yeah. the relaxation, and they can be just making it worse, not better. Mm. Yeah, and, and if you did start doing Kegel, because sometimes you get that, you're mm. oh, this was happening, I did my Kegels, it got worse, so obviously physio and pelvic floor exercise mm. isn't uh, going to be helpful. Yeah. yeah, they don't work. <laughs> if you did Kegels and your symptoms got worse, um, it's either your technique is not great, because actually um, more than half of women in research studies it's been shown more than half of women do an incorrect contraction of their pelvic floor um so you may not have that connection with the the muscle system um so you need some correction and coaching on that or it's not the right way to exercise it and again it comes down to getting something individualized that's really meaningful and useful to your body and your situation rather than just trying to do the this might help and DIY it yeah, <laughs> although I try not to sell the DIY. I do really encourage women to trust their own instincts a little bit more because um, I think that's where a, a lot of women come into us and they've lost a lot of confidence in themselves um, because, you know, they, they're not trusting their bodies anymore. And, yeah, I, and, again, that's part of my job is to try and just get you connected, get you back in your body and know that you can you can do this. Back feeling that womanly thing. I guess. <laughs> I'm really great with my words to that, everybody. <laughs> I, just, I work with women. <laughs> Not very common that I'm without words. That's <laughs> just amazing. Um, so I haven't had any more questions come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave everyone with that. Um, Dr. Matt, Chris, thank you so much. You have just informed every single one of us here about like everything pelvic wise you know why would I be getting this pain what can I do to fix it why you know why obstetrician and gynecologist works with physiotherapists like it just all has you know all those pieces of the puzzle to bring together and create that toolbox that we need to make sure that we're getting the best out of ourselves so that is just phenomenal